we might need to have a coughing break halfway through the sermon. It seems like everybody's got the bug. Why do some men mistreat women? Why do some men mistreat, injure, or even kill their wives or their partners? Um, an online source that I referred to in last week's lesson says, and I quote, there is no one cause of domestic violence. That same source goes on to say that a range of factors may contribute to a man being inclined to domestic violence. But it does add that just because a man has some of those uh, factors in his background, it doesn't automatically mean that he is going to be violent. Similarly, uh, Dr. Grant Martin, in his book, Counseling for Family Violence and Abuse, lists nine different personality characteristics and social factors which can have an influence. I don't have time to go through all of these in detail. I have touched on some of them last week, particularly uh, to do with negative parental influences. So today I'm just going to touch on, I think, about four key factors. But before I go into that, I want to go uh, and look at or just mention a couple of examples in the Bible. Um, one is in 1 Samuel chapter 25, beginning in verse 3. And this refers to a man named Nabal. Nabal was a very wealthy farmer who was married to a lady named Abigail. They lived in the southern region of Judah uh, just before David became king of Judah. So we can say somewhere between, let's say, 1025 and 1050 BC. Uh, I haven't got time to read through all of this, but if you notice several verses, you'll see some of Nabal's characteristics, for instance, in uh, 1 Samuel 25 and verse 3, in the latter part of that verse, the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. Uh, you go down to verse 14, where um, it's reported at the end of that verse that he had spoken, Nabal had spoken, uh, to David's men with anger. We go on to verse 17 and the end of that verse. It says no one can speak to him. You can't have a conversation with Nabal. And then we go on further to verse 36 where he gets drunk. So here uh, in that one chapter, we've got the fact that Nabal is harsh, he is evil, he is an angry man, he is unwilling to listen to others, and he gets drunk. So what sort of husband do you think he might have been? How do you think he might have treated his wife, <clears throat> Abigail, at times? So that's one man. The other is Diotrephes, uh, in that passage that uh, Raymond just read to us from Third John. And Diotrephes was apparently a Christian, although he certainly didn't act like one. Uh, John says in 3 John verse 9 uh, that Diotrephes loves to be first. He likes to be number one. He likes to be in control. Uh, continuing on in verse 9, he does not accept what we say. So he was unwilling to listen even to an apostle. Um, in, then going on into verse 10, he unjustly accuses us with malicious words. So he makes false accusations against others, including John. Uh, he does not receive the brothers. Now, if you go back uh, earlier in that chapter, it talks about Christians who would come through. Uh, they were acting in the name uh, of the truth. 
uh, and um, so the indication is they were perhaps traveling evangelists, something like that. But um, Diotrephes would not receive such people, and what's more, he forbade others in the congregation to receive these people. If others in the congregation tried to show hospitality, then Diotrephes <laughs> would throw them out. So this man is a real controller. And again, if he was married, we don't know, but if he was married, what sort of husband would he have been? And how might he have treated his wife? So just with those as background illustration, let's consider some of the key uh, factors that we need to be aware of and uh, avoid or overcome. The, the first one is the need to be in control. And that's what we see with diotrophies. The online site, SciCentral.com, which I've referred to in my previous sermon, says this, domestic violence is about power and control. Um, the same site goes on to say that one of the factors which can uh, incline a man to abuse women is that he holds, quote, certain belief systems about hierarchy and domination. Hierarchy where you've got people of various levels of power and also uh, uh, the idea of being the dominant one. Dr. Grant Martin, in his book, Counseling for Family Violence and Abuse, says this, Violent men tend to have more inflexible beliefs about the roles and functions of their spouses. Many batterers, and he's talking about wife batterers, are very dominating and demand control of almost every aspect of their families. They expect to make all major decisions and they tend to become angry if their wives disagree or act independently. Using his religious belief for support, the man who beats his wife tends to adhere to a male dominant role which requires that he, one, never appears weak, Two, can solve all his problems without asking for help. Three, make all important family decisions. Four, receive deferential treatment from his wife and children. Five, be in control of his emotions, particularly in public. Now, this idea of receiving deferential treatment, um, that's de defined as submitting or yielding to the judgment, opinion, will of in this case, the husband or the father. So he has to be boss and the rest of the family has to recognise that he is the boss. Now, I talked about this um, two weeks ago when I talked about how religious men can distort what the Bible is saying and use it to justify their conduct towards their wives and their families. Um, but we went through the scriptures at that time and we saw that's a total misinterpretation of the scriptures. God created and blessed women as well as men. In regard to salvation, God makes no distinction between women and men. Christ, during his earthly ministry, treated women with respect, treated them kindly. <coughs> In God's scheme of things, men and women are mutually dependent. In other words, we need one another. Um, the fact that the woman is man's helper does not make her a slave, as we saw. The same Hebrew word which talks about a woman as a helper is also applied to God as a helper, and God is by no means our slave. Yes, Eve sinned first, but in the New Testament, the Bible places just as much responsibility upon Adam. And yes, the husband is the leader in the home. But as we saw from Ephesians, that leadership is to be unselfish. It is to be self-sacrificing. The husband is to act for the good of his wife. He is to follow the example that Christ set. So God in no way calls men to be dictatorial 
uh, acting uh, towards their wives as though the husband is the boss and the wife is the slave. That is not biblical in any way. Um, I referred a, a while ago to the idea that some husbands have that they are the ones that need to make all the major decisions in the house. And they need to exercise complete control. They need to, the saying goes today, micromanage their way, their wives. And the idea there is they've got to watch every little detail and uh, make decisions about every little detail, telling their wives what to do and what not to do. We'll come back to Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, there is a passage here about the excellent wife. And what you see is that, yes, the wife carries out uh, her role as a wife, according to the Bible, but her husband doesn't boss her. He doesn't have to tell her everything that she's able to do. I begin in Proverbs 31, verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And, he, and notice that. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He's not watching her all the time to find fault. Uh, verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and linen and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships, she brings her food from afar and she rises while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her attendants. She considers a field and buys it. Notice that. From her earnings she plants a vineyard. She surrounds her waist with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her profit is good, her lamp does not go out at night, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. Uh, that has to do with spinning. Uh, you can ask Terry about that. Uh, verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. And then I'll drop down to verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. So she's got her own business going, if you like. She conducts trade. She buys property. She sells things. She uses the profit that she makes for further activities. So verse 28, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her. You don't get the idea of a dominating husband keeping his thumb on his wife, not allowing her to show any initiative or to do anything. Quite the contrary here. What you see is a husband and wife as a team. Yes, there's the family responsibilities regarding the home. Yes, the husband has responsibilities. But the wife also has things she chooses to do. <clears throat> the site central.com online site that I've been referring to gives a number of factors which could lead to a man developing a controlling personality. And if a man has some of these factors, then he needs to address them. Uh, he might have less access to education, uh, personality disorders, substance abuse, such as drugs and alcohol, cultural attitudes. And I talked about this last week. Under some cultures, there's certain ideas about what men should be and what husbands should be, what wives should be. Gender ideologies. And again, I've spoken about that. Some people, uh, men in particular, have a certain idea of where a woman fits into things, where a wife fits into things. He may have low self-esteem. And thus he just got to assert himself to compensate. He may struggle with anger management, and I'll come to that in a moment. He may be insecure, and so again there's this uh, feeling, this need to um, stand up for himself. So there's a range of factors that are involved. Uh, um, because a husband's need to be in control 
may be a cause of domestic violence and abuse, then we need to be careful about the advice that we give to a wife who may be caught up in these circumstances. Maybe you might know a woman, you might have a friend at work, a female who is experiencing some of this. Um, the SciCentral.com site says this, even if you, and this is talking about the spouse, in, in the case we talk about the wife, even if you do everything possible to please an abusive partner, their need to control you will likely still show itself through their behaviour eventually. So you're trying to be submissive uh, to, to stop the abuse, but if a man has this controlling streak, no matter how much you submit, he's still going to dememonstrate that attitude. Is a, if a wife is abused because husband's need for control, then it's not her fault. So Dr. Grant Martin <coughs> says this, many abused wives seek help from their pastors, he's using that word in a denominational sense, uh, seek help from their pastors or Christian counsellors, only to be told that they should be more submissive and or sexually available to their husbands. The implication being that the wife is not an obedient Christian woman and that it is her fault that her husband gets angry. This kind of counsel only serves to increase the guilt level and keeps the husband from taking responsibility for his actions. So, if a husband, and especially a Christian husband, feels that he must be in total control of his wife, and she must be in total subjection to him, then he really needs to get some advice. He really needs to get some counseling, some guidance. He really needs to understand uh, what God is saying in the Bible about men and women and what God is not saying. You can't use the Bible to justify uh, domestic violence and abuse. So that, that's one area, the need that some men have to be in control. <clears throat> a second area is the problem of resentment. This could arise in a couple of ways. One is that maybe uh, the man has had a controlling mother uh, and uh, he grows up with a resentment towards women because of his negative ex experiences. There's another that became apparent to me just in the last few years. Um, you may have a resentment, a man may have a resentment as a form of immaturity. Um, a man marries and with it, step by step, he finds himself taking on more and more responsibility or faced with more and more responsibility, particularly as children arise. And so he finds that after work he needs to come home and help with things in the house, spend time with his wife and then also with his children and so forth. No longer is he free to just go out on a whim after work and do what he wants to. And uh, he also needs to spend time with his wife on the weekends, considering what she would like to do rather than him just going off and doing what he wants. And then uh, there's the matter of household chores and he can't just leave the house uh, in a mess all the time. Uh, he needs to take responsibility uh, around the house and the garden. Um, then there's the issue of dealing with all the challenges of responsibilities of children. And especially if he is an obsessive compulsive type or is on that spectrum. So he's going to want the children to do things exactly right, exactly on time, and that's going to cause problems. And then of course running around after the children during the week, during the weekend, sports activities and so forth. And then there's spending time with the wider family. You've, you've got your own parents to consider and you've got your wife's family to consider, the in-laws. And so a man may be resentful of all of this, this loss of personal freedom. And he thinks, well, life was a lot less demanding before I got married. 
And really, if that's the way a man is thinking, then that's really a matter of immaturity. It's an indication of selfishness. It uh, marks an inability to face up to responsibility. If that resentment keeps building, then it can lead to conflict in one form or another, maybe verbal, maybe psychological, maybe ultimately physical. And if this is the case, then such a husband needs to, again, get advice from an older, wiser, more experienced person who can help them to see the matter of responsibility that comes with marriage and parenthood. Just come over to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. There's a passage there that is relevant. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Um, and that's not just talking about wife and children. If you go back earlier in chapter 5, it's also talking about helping one's parents, especially if one of the parents is uh, widowed. So part of being a Christian is not only coming to church, it's also taking responsibility for your family, the extended family. So this problem of resentment, if it's there, needs to be dealt with. Then there's the problem of anger. Anger is not always wrong, but anger does need to be controlled. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. There is what is called appropriate anger and there is inappropriate anger. Ephesians 4 verse 26, therefore ridding yourselves of, I'm looking at verse 25, I'm drop down, be angry and yet do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger. So even if it might be a, a justified anger over something, you shouldn't let it eat away and go on and on and on. When a man is constantly angry, when that becomes their instant response to uh, problems, when he's unable to control his anger, then there is a major problem. Anger can so readily turn to violence and abuse. Last week I talked about how um, children can be influenced by the negative example of their parents. And that can be the case with anger as well. If you have a look at Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Do not make friends with a person given to anger or go with a hot-tempered person or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. So anger can uh, influence others. And if that's the case, then that can happen in the home as well. Children growing up with an angry father. Um, <clears throat> anger can be the product of many things in, in a person's background. It can uh, arise from abuse or neglect of the child by the parents. It can arise from parental separation and divorce. It can arise from sexual abuse of the child. Um, as Dr. Martin says, and I'll quote this, it can arise from dysfunctional family environments where appropriate problem solving was never observed, unquote. In other words, that's a family where things are a bit of a mess and uh, the circumstances aren't handled well. There was another uh, point raised to me actually by one of the security guards here at the school years ago. And he came <clears throat> from another part of the world and he'd gone to school with uh, boys uh, from his part of the world as well. And he said one of the factors... Um, comes from being trapped between cultures. Um, 
you know, the children are brought from one culture, so they're no longer a part of the culture where they lived, where they grew up, where they were familiar. They come here <clears throat> to an unfamiliar culture, and they find, in some cases, they're not accepted. They can't adjust to the culture. They don't really understand the culture. And so they're trapped in between, and so they follow the the wrong examples, they've got this anger within them, and that anger develops, and this security guard that I got to know, he was saying that various of the boys that he'd gone to school with who were in this situation ended up in prison. So um, culture uh, can be a problem where, you know, there's migrating from one culture to another, and that's something um, to be conscious of here in Australia because so many of us come from another culture. Uh, Doctors Minur and also Maya in their book Happiness is a Choice identify what they regard as three key forms of inappropriate anger. Number one, anger that results when one's selfish demands are not being met. Number two, anger that results when one's perfectionist demands are not being satisfied. Uh, this is where you've got a, a man who uh, is a bit obsessive, compulsive, who expects too much of himself, too much of others, and then he's frequently getting angry with himself and with others because things are not up to his expectations. And then a third area, anger that results from suspiciousness, and I'll quote what they have to say on this, when a person has a few paranoid personality traits, he will frequently misinterpret the motives of others and thereby get angry with them. And some people are like that, they're, they're a bit insecure, they, they're, they're feeling that people are laughing at them or that people are against them. Uh, paranoid means delusions of persecution, and that doesn't have to be fully... Uh, blown, but it may be that some people, as I say, have this insecurity, and so again, uh, they become angry uh, with circumstances and with others. So, what do we do? There's a lot of things. I haven't got time to go through everything here. One of the things, of course, is to recognize and acknowledge that you have a problem with anger and you say well how do I do that well sometimes you may not realize or admit just how angry you are how frequently you get angry and so something you can do and you can do this with various problems is to keep a diary you say no I'm not going to that that's that's not what a man does well if we're sincere about wanting to overcome a problem then we'll do what needs to be done. And okay, that's calling for some self-motivation. Well, if you want some motivation to deal with such a problem, come over to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. There's some motivation here. And really, if you love your wife and children, that should be motivation. But here's another one. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behaviour, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Our salvation is at jeopardy if we're not going to control these problems if we have them. And so that should motivate us to take steps that are necessary. And if that calls for something like keeping a diary, just making a note of the times when you get angry, well, then you do that. And that might be a surprise to see how often you do get angry. Another step in this is to learn forgiveness. Now, really... If you're a person that's always angry, it's not that everybody else is doing the wrong thing all the time. And maybe sometimes somebody does the wrong thing. Okay, in that situation, you need to learn to forgive. And people say, oh, that's just a religious ideal. 
Actually, it's not. In the last couple of decades, there have been community groups set up um, to uh, develop this idea of forgiveness because you get people who experience dreadful crimes and they come to the realisation that either they let their, uh, their lives be eaten up with anger and vengeance seeking or else they have to forgive. And that has been put into uh, application uh, even here in, in Sydney over recent years. As I've already said, anger is too big a, a subject to discuss just in a few minutes. Uh, there's a lot of help that is available. <coughs> There's books on the subject. Um, there's help in the church. There are people, older people, uh, who can give advice and can help. This anger management courses. Um, I discovered um, while I was preparing this, I've actually prepared a series uh, called Changing Bad Habits to Good, and that does include uh, a lesson on anger. And I, I did that on the computer, so that's available. Uh, if anybody wants it, I can just email that through. So anger, and then one more, and that's alcohol dependency. Uh, and you've got a, a, a range of views in the church, from congregation to congregation and within congregations. There are some brethren that have made it almost the centerpiece of Christianity, that thou shalt not drink, and, and they, they make that a major issue. Um, there are others who are quite lackadaisical about it. They'll say, well, look, you know, whatever I decide I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. It's not all that harmful. Well, we need to realise that alcohol is a potent force. We need to face up to it. We need to face up to how it affects us and how it affects others. Let me give you three quotes here from the Royal Commission on Human Relationships. Um, it's the final report of that handed down in November 1977, according to my notes. Uh, three quotes. Number one, many of the problems of human relationships, particularly for families, are bound up with alcohol. And this, incidentally, was an Australian uh, Royal Commission. Uh, number two, the community suffers in terms of street brawls and domestic violence, broken families, neglected and deprived children. And quote number three, Christina Gibson from Elsie Woman's Refuge says that most women who come to Elsie leave men who are alcoholics or heavy drinkers and who become violent when they drink. Uh, and then from the Sydney Morning Herald, June 2018. Alcohol is a contributing factor in over half of all family violence incidents. And also quoting from that same article in the Sydney Morning Herald, um, it goes on, it, the, well, the, the article is basically about the high levels of drinking associated with major sporting events and the effects that drinking has. So let me read you a bit of that. There is massive spike in the rate of family violence in New South Wales on rugby league state of origin game days. According to a new report from the Centre for Alcohol Policy Research at La Trobe University in Melbourne, the report reviewed data collected over six years by the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. It revealed an increase of nearly 40% in domestic assaults in New South Wales on state of origin nights compared with other Wednesdays. Dr Livingston said that his previous work also revealed a rise in alcohol related harm on AFL grand final day in Victoria. A spokesman for one refuge in Queanbeyan, Queanbeyan's near Canberra, said that on June the 5th and June the 7th, which would be a Tuesday and a Thursday, support workers had no emergency calls. On June the 6th, Wednesday, the night of the first State of Origin game, the team leader reported that support workers were on the phone for two hours dealing with calls from women in need. So alcohol needs to be treated. 
uh, my fear, indeed my observation is, society tends to be far more conscious of the alcohol problems than we do in the church. We tend to treat it lightly. Um, why is alcohol a problem? It's because alcohol removes inhibitions, causing people to do what ordinarily they wouldn't do. Quoting from the Royal Commission again, alcohol abuse does make it easier for someone to have an episode of interpersonal violence when they are intoxicated than when they are sober. And I've heard people, and that includes Christians, who say that alcohol doesn't affect them, they know their limit. The drinker is the last person to know whether they're being affected, and that has been demonstrated uh, by tests done on drinkers. Uh, people are affected, the drinker is affected, before they're ever aware. And we can go back again to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 23, verses 31 and 32. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and stings like a viper. And I've spent 40 or more years accumulating data on smoking and drinking and drugs and so forth. There's a wealth of material on the problems associated with alcohol. So, some of the causes of male domestic violence. Number one, the need to be in control. Number two, the problem of resentment. Number three, the problem of anger. Number four, the problem of alcohol. And I've only dealt with part of issue both in today's lesson and the three lessons that I've, I've taught on this. But male violence towards women, and specifically male domestic violence, is a problem in Australia and in other countries, and it is a problem even amongst men who would regard themselves as Christians. Even in the last couple of weeks that I've preached this series, there's been more news about domestic assaults and so forth. Um, there are many causes that has to be acknowledged. It shouldn't happen, but it does. Even, as I said, among those who regard themselves as Christians. And that is not what God intends. It is not what the Bible supports. So, we need to face up to the problem. If we are experiencing the problem, we need to admit the problem, we need to deal with the problem, we need to overcome the problem. And it may be that you know somebody or will meet somebody who faces the problem because it is quite widespread. We also need to teach our children and set the right example to our children so that when they grow up, it isn't a problem for them. God intends for a wife to be her husband's companion, not his victim. Let's stand to see. <coughs>